Woohoo! Hey, Lifehouse, I'm having a blast back here in kids' ministry. Believe it or not, on a normal weekend, I don't ever get a chance to come back here and hang out with our amazing kids and our amazing kids' ministry. But today, it's not a normal weekend. And so I get a chance to be back here. I'm getting a chance to see all the amazing things going on in our awesome kids' ministry. So here's a little bit of what I saw. I saw our kids having a blast. They have a ton of fun in kids' ministry. Not only are they having fun, but they are hearing an inspiring message about God's love. It's always age appropriate, but I'm telling you, every one of these kids are hearing about how God loves them and how they can find their hope in Jesus. They're surrounded by loving dream teamers, meaning our volunteers who serve every weekend, who love your kids. If you're a parent within Lifehouse, your kids are in great hands. This place is secure. We, on purpose, we take great precautions to make sure it's very safe, very secure for your children, but it's also fun and you have uh, volunteers and leaders that absolutely care for and love your kids. And so, hey, here's the deal. I want to uh, let you know how you can get involved. If you would, you want to be part of this, simply text Dream Team to 41411. That's right, Dream Team to 41411. When you do that, someone's going to follow up with you and help you begin the process of getting plugged into being part of the Dream Team at Kids Ministry. Hey, I don't want to take up any more time because I want to hand it over to Pastor Corey, who is doing our leading, our student takeover weekend as we wrap up this sermon series, The Good Life. What is up, Life House? It's Student Takeover Weekend. I'm super pumped to be here. I know I see some of our students around in the place. Hey, I want to say also to all of our campuses, to all those watching online, I'm so glad that you're here. Um, what I want to do before I even dive into the Word, before I dive into anything, we like to do this at Lifehouse Youth. We like to just give away free stuff. Does anyone want free stuff? Anybody? I don't know. Like, I've got, so does, here, I'm going to start with this, the most dangerous one. Also, if you're watching online, we've, we've, and at our other campuses, some students are going to come out and start chucking free stuff away. If you're watching online, maybe there's, like, students hiding in your bedroom. I don't know. That's really weird. I'm sorry. Or if you're driving, be careful. There might be a student in your back seat. Um, no, we're going to give away some free stuff. I got a Frisbee. Anyone want a Frisbee? I feel like I want to go up in the balcony with this. I want to see if I can do the balcony. Who's ready? I'm going to try. Oh, oh, epic fail. That was so bad. That was so bad. I have a t-shirt. Anyone want a We Are Fam t-shirt? I see, I'm just gonna blindly throw. Here we go, I'm gonna blindly, like, it, it hit the camera. I'm doing terrible. This is my favorite. Anyone like snapbacks? This is, this is my favorite gift. Let's see, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try, go all the way back here. Let's see, where'd it go? Oh, there we go. You gotta put that on, you gotta put it on. That looks good, that looks good. All right, I'm excited. We're gonna dive in. And here's what I know about tonight. I'm super excited about this message tonight. Here's what I'm praying. Here's what I'm believing. Um, it's one of those messages that is, you know, it's simple. The truth is it's impossibly simple, but it's simply impossible. See what I did there? All right. And so what I want to do is I want to just give away the scripture. All right. So we're going to bring up the scripture and I'm almost like spoiler warning. I'm giving you the scripture first thing. So it's going to be right here. Here's our very first scripture. Here we are. We're in Titus 3, 3 through 7. It says this. It wasn't so long ago that we ourselves were stupid and stubborn. <laughs> I'm going to pause there. For some of you, <laughs> maybe this was the car ride, <laughs> right? For a second, let it sink in. This is the message translation, right? For a second, let it sink in. It's Paul here. Paul's calling you stupid and stubborn. Not me. It's Paul, okay? So we were stupid and stubborn, dupes of sin, ordered every which way by our glands, going around with a chip on our shoulder, hated and hating back. But when God, our kind and loving Savior, God stepped in, he saved us from all of that. It was all his doing. We had nothing to do with it. He gave us a good bath, and we came out of it new people. Washed inside and out by the Holy Spirit, our Savior Jesus poured out new life so generously. God's gift has restored our relationship with him and given us back our lives. And there's more. 
Wait, there's more than that? There's more life to come. An eternity of life, you can count on this. Can I say this, Lifehouse? If you do not get excited about Scripture, there is something wrong with us. Are you, come on, are you excited about God's promises and His Word? Talk about the good life. This is what we're talking about tonight. It doesn't get much better than that. So can I pray for us? Heavenly Father, God, I pray that your word would be alive in this place. God, I pray that your word right now um, would be real to us. Heavenly Father, that it would maybe challenge us and convict us in this place tonight. I thank you so much that we get to lean on your word, that it is still moving and still alive to this day, and it's the greatest message of all time. So God, I pray that we would hear it, God, in our hearts and in our minds and in our soul. In your precious name, and everyone said, Amen. amen. Let me ask you a question. And I want us to be honest. Have you ever wanted to do good, but then didn't? Yeah, right? <laughs> All of us. Every single one of us, myself included. If I could just be real, let's talk personally for a second. Um, it isn't until recently that I've started to do something about my weight. I'm just being honest. Isn't it recently I started calorie counting? That's, I, I hate it. But I knew I had to do something about it. But I've known for a long time that I needed to tackle it. For like a really long time. The truth is, since I graduated high school and I didn't have a coach pushing me all the time. Like, so I've known for a long time, but I haven't done anything about it. And maybe right now you're processing through what that looks like for you personally. All right, so we've got our personal things. But that's not really our message Let's talk, about, let's talk about the world, all right? I want to give you, um, I wanna give you some, some bad news, all right? Let's talk about our world for a second. I recently read a study that said um, it, it, it tracked how many times in all, like, different countries people said thank you. All right, so you tracking? Guess what, guys? America, number one, Right? But before we pat ourselves on the back, let me explain to you what, what it went on to say. The study went on to say that the reasons that Americans say thank you more than any other country is because other countries, the culture of just kind deeds, acts of kindness, is just assumed. Uh-oh. Right? <laughs> As I'm reading this, maybe you feel, feel like I feel. In other countries, it's just assumed that people are going to do the right thing, and it's assumed that they're thankful. And so here in America, we don't have a culture of acts of kindness. But let's, let's take it even deeper. What about a great cause? What about a cause that we want to get behind? Right? You're scrolling through Facebook, and you see all these cause and, and, and activism in our world. And the truth is they're like, hey, share this post. Hashtag this. Give us a like. Donate. Let me tell you about another study. Another study said that in America, 42% of people don't trust charities. We don't trust charitable organizations. And so as you're scrolling past on social media, your initial thought is like, are they even making a difference? Are they even making an impact? I don't know. D does that actually help the people in need? And so you can kind of see where this message is going. Truth is, a lot of us have a lot of thoughts and a lot of opinions that maybe we scroll through Facebook or Instagram or Twitter and that you've seen this. You've seen a tragedy. You've seen somewhere in our world where there's pain and there's hurt. And as we scroll by, we think, I'm going to comment our thoughts and prayers go out. But I don't know about you, but I've seen this. I've actually seen this in response. Our thoughts and our prayers. But other people say, keep, keep your thoughts and keep your prayers. What are you actually doing? Now, I want to clarify something. I believe so much in the power of prayer. I truly believe that it should be, as Christ followers, it should be our first and foremost response to the tragedy and the struggles and the need in our world is to bring those things before God. But the truth is I also understand where people come from, where they say, well, <laughs> keep your thoughts and keep your prayers. What are you actually doing in living, and the truth is, is I understand that. I can get that. Because I think we live in a culture, and Christians are just as much as fault to say that I'm a lot of talk, 
but do my actions match what I'm saying? So here's the thing. If all we do is pray, we're missing something so valuable about the message of compassion, the message that Jesus taught. We're missing. It's not the full message. I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray. I'm not saying that we shouldn't talk. The truth is that getting, getting information out there, sharing with the masses about injustice in our world, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but we devalue our talk when there's no action. It's meaningless. And so we have to look at this and we have to talk about this. Can I say one more thing? Because we rarely actually do anything. And here's just the honest truth. As I thought about this message, as I thought about my own life, as I've thought about the church, if we believe that there's a God and he loves us, if we believe that he loves us so much, and if you believe in that and you have faith in that, then you also must believe there is an enemy and he is real. And the enemy's goal is to, to steal and kill and destroy your life. But here's the thing. I've realized this. I truly believe that I think the enemy is perfectly fine with us talking. The enemy is okay with our talk. The truth is, I think the enemy is saying this. Go ahead and talk. Because the more you talk and the less that you do the more you make the church hypocritical. And so he's okay with our talk. Hmm. Let me give you some more stats. In 2005, according to a study, there was 85% of young adults that had sufficient background within the church, meaning they grew up in the church, they've been around church uh, for many, many years, that were no longer within the church. 85% of them viewed the church as hypocritical. 84% of them said that they knew a, a Christian. I know a Christ follower, but out of that 84% that said, I know a Christ follower, only 14% of them said that that Christ follower actually lives different than the cultural norm. The only logical conclusion from this study is to say that as Christians, as Christ followers, we don't actively live out our faith. I'm telling you, this message hits hard, even for me, even to be up on the stage and say, this hits hard. And let me ask you this question. How many times have you told somebody or messaged somebody or wrote a post or a comment that says, I'll keep you in my prayers? Did you? That hurts. Even me. Do we actually do the things that we believe in? And it starts at just saying, did we even pray? If we didn't act on even prayer, there's something wrong. There's something broken. So thank God we can turn to Scripture. Thank God that we have scripture. I'm going to set this up a little bit before we read it. But here's what we've been in the book of Titus. And in the book of Titus here, we, uh, we find Paul um, in Titus, they're going to plant this church in the island of Crete. Um, and so Paul would have been with Titus for, for a good little while to, to get this kind of the backbone of the church going and get this church planted. But eventually he would have moved on to continue his mission and he would have wrote back to the church in the island of Crete. Now, now we've been in this kind of sermon series, so I'm going to give you just what you need here. Now, the island of Crete was a, it was a terrible place. It was a rough place. It was known as one of the roughest places in all of the ancient world. Talking about like pirates and crime and selfishness and, and pride. I mean, just a nasty place. And so they're planning a church here. So no doubt Titus, the, the leader of the church, he needed some encouragement. And so Paul writes back to Titus to encourage him. He says this. He says, remind the people. This is how he starts. Remind the people to respect the government and be law-abiding. Always ready to lend a helping hand. No insults, no fights. God's people should be big-hearted and courteous. 
So Paul starts, and he says, look, I just want to encourage you, please, 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 don't fall back into living the way that you see everyone else living. Remember, be law-abiding. Respect the government. Be law-abiding. Set an example to the people. Don't fall back. Because the truth is, it's not much, this is no different than our world. How easy is it for us to just be like, I'm just going to do what everyone else is doing. Everyone else is selfish. Everyone else is kind of just thinking about themselves. It's so consumed with them and who they are and their day and their schedule and, and, and what they have to do that I can live that way too. And Paul's saying, no, 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 please, please, don't fall back into what you see everyone else doing around you. Don't do it. And then he continues with this next passage of Scripture. Here's this fun one. It wasn't so long ago that we ourselves... Paul Smart, he includes himself. <laughs> we ourselves were stupid and stubborn. Dupes of sin, ordered every which way by our glands, going around with a chip on our shoulder, hated and hating back. So he says, wait a second. For a second, just slow down. Slow down in a second and remember where I found you. Just remember that as you look around, as you look around your world and you see sinful, hate-filled people, as you see them, remember that you too, you too were once a sinner. And I found you and I loved you even while you were a sinner. And so for a second, just pause and have grace on people. I think if we all just slowed down long enough to view people the way God views them, that that person at your workplace who's just, just a bad person, just doesn't treat people kind, remember, God loves them. God, he sent his son to die for them. Students, you're getting ready to go back to school. That bully, I, it's tough, man. I got to say, like, being a youth pastor, and, and I'm only 31. I, like to, I'm, I feel old, but <laughs> I'm only 31. But the world has changed so drastically since I was in school. That the truth is, what students are walking through in our schools right now is like nothing I've ever seen before. And we just want to give them simple like, ah, oh, just, you know, it'll be okay. Don't worry. No, no, no. They need real counseling. They need real help. And so those, the students that are picking on you, the truth is, even at the end of all that, after I say all that, the truth is God sent his son to die for them. So remember where you came from. And so I say all that to say this. This is my first point. I encourage you, if you're taking notes, write this down. If you're watching online, uh, jot this down. Um, it's this. Be always ready. I pulled it right from that first passage of Scripture. Be always ready. Now, here's the funny part of the message. I warned you at the beginning. You're like, oh, always hear these main points. And the truth is, you're like, that's, that seems impossibly simple. And it is. It's impossibly simple. But it's simply impossible. <laughs> and here's the reason why. To be always ready, the truth is, that's perfection. That's Jesus Christ. But we have this problem inside of us, and this problem is called sin. And we're born with it. Can I say this? I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old. My children were born with sin, okay? <laughs> like, you think about it. If you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. Because one of the very first concepts that kids begin to understand is mine. Mine. We are selfish people. We're born that way. That's my three-year-old right now. Everything is mine and his. He shares every once in a while. And again, we're like, yeah, good job, man. But man, they go at it hard because it's just mine. And the truth is, we don't ever grow up from that. We don't get away from that. We, we're like, everything is mine. And it's this problem inside of us called sin. And sin's whole desire is to separate us further and further and further away from God. But God said, mm -mm, not on my watch. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, who stepped right in the middle of our sin. And he lived a perfect life that he was the perfect sacrifice for us. And he died on a cross for you and for me and for our sins. Forever defeated the grave in sin. That simply through our small measure of faith, 
we gain access to the Holy Spirit. So God's Holy Spirit comes and lives and dwells within us. And it is because of the Holy Spirit that we're given power to be always ready. Always ready. So we keep moving on. This changes everything. It changes absolutely everything. Because when you realize what God did for us, what Christ did for us, that you begin to realize that what your home, what your children, what your marriage, what your neighborhood, what your neighbors, what your workplace, what our schools, what our city, and what our world needs is, yes, our thoughts and our prayers, but also our salvation-filled actions. That's what it actually needs. Paul continues to write, and he says this in Titus 3, 8. I want you to put your foot down. Take a firm stand on these matters so that those who have put their trust in God will concentrate on the essentials that are good for everyone. Here's your next point. Simply this. We need to define everyone. I'm telling you, it's not that hard. You probably already know where I'm going with this. We have to define everyone. What is good for everyone? And there's two things that I think that we need to do to help us define everyone. That if we pause long enough to say, you know what? If I stop just thinking about myself for a second, I could answer this question. And the first one is simply this. Is it problems or people? If you are so focused on yourself... If I am so focused on myself all of the time, I guarantee you what I'm going to see in this world is problems. Problems that affect me. Problems that even affect others. But all of a sudden, when you begin to shift your lens more towards God's lens, you don't see problems, you see people. And we have to see people. Because that's what God sees. God's like, I already saw the problem. The problem was sin, and I sent Jesus Christ for people. And so he's saying, I'm calling you to see people and not the problems. I've already dealt with that. I'm the answer to that. Guess what? You're not the answer to this. I am. See people. Just see people. The second thing is this. That when we stop seeing problems... When we start seeing people, I got that backwards. <laughs> when, we, when, we start, when we stop seeing people and we start seeing problems, here's what happens. This is the second thing that, where we get this wrong. If all we see is problems, here's the honest truth. The problems of our world are too big. They're too big. And so if we only see problems, we get overwhelmed. Here's, here's, a, here's an example. We can scroll through Facebook or something like that. We can see the stats and all stuff. The truth is, if, if we're not seeing people, we're only seeing problems, we can become so overwhelmed by the problem of world hunger that we miss the hungry people right in front of us. That you can be so overwhelmed. This is too big. This, I can't do anything. It's too big, God. That our mindset is just set on like, it doesn't matter. That you're missing the hungry people God has put in front of you. And so is it too big or is it personal? Here's kind of a plug for you. You want a global perspective on this. I'm going to challenge you and encourage you. Uh, get more information. Sign up for a mission trip. I'm telling you, if you've never been on a mission trip, if you've never been overseas, if you've never served, you know what you do? You make the problems of our world personal. And I'm telling you, it'll change your life forever. You want a local perspective on the problems that we have right here? Talk to our outreach department. Talk to Jason Summers. Get involved. Say, you know what? I want to go on an outreach, and I want to see what we have right here. Because all of a sudden, you make it personal. That it's not just scrolling through Facebook. It's not just seeing the problems. It's not just going, oh, Hagerstown. <laughs> no, you make it personal. 
And you can tackle personal things. And so do you see problems or do you see people? Is it too big or is it personal? The church. Let me talk about the church for a second. When it comes to, we use the example, when it comes to world hunger, if you didn't know this, if we simply lived this out, if we lived out the good news and the gospel, the church could be the largest resource and financial resource in the world that it could completely eradicate world hunger. That is actually a fact. The church alone, not a government, not another country, the church alone could completely eradicate world hunger. So we have to think, why don't we? You know, I love being part of Lifehouse because the truth is I, I, I truly, I've, I've been here for a while and I truly believe that this church believes in mission and mission on point and living missional. And we give so much to missions and what you give goes to actually helping people. And I hope that you can see that. I hope that you can believe that and what we show you and what you're a part of. And I love being a part of this church. But to realize the church alone could eradicate world hunger. It's clearly an issue that we don't live out our faith. So Paul continues with this last thing. People have to learn to be diligent in their work so that all necessities are met, especially among the needy, and they don't end up with nothing to show for their lives. Here's the last point that I'm going to give you. Show up. Show up. The world is desperate for us to show up people that are saying, you know what, I'm going to, I'm not just going to like say things. I'm not just going to sit here and hear a message and just then go back to living how everyone else lives. You need to show up. And let me unpack that a little bit. Show up with your skills. Show up with the things that you know how to do. Get involved with things. You're like, hey, that's right up my alley, and that's how I can give back from the skills, that my knowledge and what I'm good at. Show up with your skills. Show up with your gifts. We all have spiritual gifts, and we get to know them by getting to know God and the spirit within us, and we show up with our spiritual gifts of kindness and love and mercy and grace. Show up with your finances. That if God has blessed you with financial resource, Show up with your finances. Can I challenge you? I love that our pastor, he has this kind of mantra, and I've so tried to instill it in my life that you live on less so that you can give more. That there's areas of your life where, like, financially, like, this isn't a necessity to say, I'm willing to cut. God, I'm willing to cut this so that you, you give me resources to give more. And so we show up financially. You take the time and you show up. Man, time is such a valuable thing to all of us. I get it. But if we just take the time to show up, and here's what showing up means. First and foremost, it means this. You show up predictably. Predictably. Can I give you a lens as to like, this is kind of what we do here. This is what we do on, on, on Thursday nights at, at, at Lifehouse Youth, on, on Sundays out of the cinemas and that kind of stuff. We show up predictably. The truth is, like, I want students to know I will be here every Thursday for you to just be a part of the family. We'll be here. The lights will be on. We'll be too loud. <laughs> we'll be here. You can predict it. You can count on it. You need to show up predictably in people's lives that they can count on you, that they can trust you, that they can know, man, this person is always there for me when I need them. Show up predictably. Secondly, show up mentally. I challenge you, it is not enough to just show up physically. Show up mentally. Let me unpack that a little bit. That means I've shown up and I've thought about how that I can give here. I've thought about that what I can add. I've, I've prayed about it. Or more than that, I'm, I'm showing up predictably, but I'm also showing up mentally that I remember the conversation I had with this person the last time I saw them. I remember their name. That's very hard for me. 
that I'm showing up mentally and I'm prepared, that maybe I'm walking into a tough situation, that I've allowed God to say, God, I'm going to need grace in this situation. I'm going to need humility. I'm going to need strength. I'm going to need courage. And I've prayed about those things, and I am prepared to show up. And then lastly, show up randomly. Say, this is just the icing on the cake. That it's a, it's a text. It's a phone call. It's just like a, hey, I'm, I'm just here to support you. I know that you're hurting. I know that you're in need. And I know this isn't the normal time that we meet, but I'm just showing up randomly in your life because I care about you. Can I tell you, that's the 10%. It's the 10% that people are just like, wow, this person actually cares. We just need to show up. And I love this saying. We have this saying around Lifehouse. We show up so God can show off. That it's not us. It's God. It's the Holy Spirit living and dwelling within us. We're not that good. Again, I go back to that, that, that passage of Scripture. You once were stupid and stubborn. Yeah, I'm not that good. That when God shows up because, or shows off because we showed up, man, that's how we're to live our lives. That's when we've seen the full, the full message of Jesus Christ, of compassion and love and grace for those hurting and broken around us. You know, Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin said this. He said, well done is better than well said. But much like Jesus did, Jesus said it better. Jesus is, is telling a story about the kingdom of God. We won't go into it, but he says this. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, done. <laughs> That means I'm actively living out my faith. I'm not just saying a lot of things. I'm actively living out my faith. Well done. Well done, good. The good life. Well done, good. That I've loved God and I've loved others as I love myself. Boom. Three in one. The greatest commandment. Love God, love others as you love yourself. That is goodness faithful, that I've lived out my faith in goodness, and it isn't a one-off in my life. It isn't just a one-time thing that, that, that I do. No, that I've committed myself to a pattern of good and faithful servant. It's what we're created to do. You and I were created with gifts and talents and purpose and desires and drives by a loving God who created you that way for a reason. I tell our students all the time, that's why the, the three commandments, love, love others as you love yourself. Yeah, you need to love yourself. Love how God created you and who you are so that we can serve, so that we can give. I just want to do this. I just want to take a moment and just pray over us. Heavenly Father, God, I'm so thankful for your word, your word that challenges and your word that convicts. So God, I pray that our hearts right now are simply saying that, God, would you convict us? God, would you convict me in this moment? of the areas of my lives, my life where I've just been holding back, where I've been selfish, where I've not given and I've not acted on my faith. God, I pray you're challenging us to take this word, to take your scripture and to go and live the good life. God, so that through Jesus Christ, you promise us eternity so that our sole purpose in life is to get to heaven and hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. In your precious name, amen. We hope that you have enjoyed today's experience. We also hope that this message has challenged you and will encourage you in the upcoming week. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ today, congratulations. Welcome to the family and welcome home. One of the most important first steps that you can take is by letting us know. You can click the prayer tab or you can visit us at lifehousechurch.org. 
And if this message or ministry has blessed you in any way, feel free to partner with us financially. You can click on the Give tab or you can visit our website and click Give. We are so thankful that you joined us and we are thankful that you are part of our extended family. We can't wait to see you back here next week.